Well, good evening, Conroe ISD family. Welcome to our YouTube live event. Today is August the 24th. This is our 6 p.m. update. It's hard to believe that this is already our 12th update. I know that it feels like we've been in this situation for well over a year, but it's hard to believe that this is number 12. And we never take for granted the fact that you welcome us into your homes and you allow us to speak with you and have these family conversations. So thank you for being a part. As always, we will archive tonight's conversation. We'll send it out to you via email as well with a, a little table of contents. So if you're not able to stay with us through the whole event, um, we'll try to help you get to the highlighted portions that you want to be a part of. But uh, we appreciate these live events because it does allow us just to have conversation. And, and it's kind of difficult to do as I stand alone in a room and just look at a camera. But um, I've felt that through our, our first 11 times through this, that we can really just have a conversation uh, as a community and talk about what we're doing and why. And I appreciate these opportunities so much. Now, tonight we're going to talk about our ramp up plan and we're going to get into a conversation about face to face instruction. And uh, we'll talk a lot of the details about face to face instruction, but that doesn't mean that our virtual learners that are going to be remote all year long aren't important to us. Um, you're very important to us and what you're going to do online throughout the year is going to be really important and all of our students, we want you to be prepared. We want you to feel loved and nurtured. And for our remote students, we want you to be ready to return to us. It might be later this year. It might be next year, but when you come back to school, we want you to feel like you've always been a part of what was going on. So we'll be very intentional moving forward about making you a part of your school, making you a part of what's going on in the school so that you don't feel that isolation and that loneliness of being a remote learner. Now, what we've talked about over and over again during these conversations is kindness matters, positivity matters, hope matters, okay? We all have to be ready to give grace and, and that's a two-way street from us to you and, and you as a community back to the school district because things change so quickly and we've we've just seen it over and over again things will change and things will come up over and over again and we have to be ready um, to handle that and i had an example from last week we had an elementary school that had a power surge and because of the power surge it actually broke one of our air conditioners in that elementary school and we had this internal conversation about wow you know if we were already in school and we didn't have air conditioning, it was 100 degrees that day, there's no way we could have had school at that elementary. We would have either been moving kids or, or had to cancel school for that day for that school. So anything can happen. And speaking of anything being able to happen, I've lived in the Texas Gulf Coast for most of my life. The only other place I've ever lived is Florida. So I've been around the Gulf of Mexico and around hurricanes my entire life. I have never in my life seen two storms at one time headed in the same direction. This is amazing. Now, I'm tired of the word unprecedented, so I'm not going to use it, uh, but it's amazing. And uh, the last update that I just got at 4 p.m. from uh, the National Weather Service still shows Laura uh, making that turn and headed to Louisiana, which Sorry for them, but it is good news for us. Um, but there are no guarantees yet. We are still in that cone of uncertainty. Now, Marco is that first storm, and it's going to kind of cut across Louisiana and come to us. Um, the experts don't seem to be too worried about that. I think it may bring us a little bit of rain, but it's not expected to be a flooding event or anything that would cause us too much trouble. But Laura, on the other hand, is a more powerful storm and is expected to be powerful. So if that storm doesn't turn, it can be a major factor for us. And I just want you to know we're ready to deal with that. We actually enacted our hurricane plan on Friday of last week, brought all of our operations team in together, and we are prepared not only to protect our schools and make whatever decisions we need to make about our personnel that works in the school, but we play a key role in the county as we provide shelter uh, buildings for for people in need. Our buses are often run on rescue missions. And so we have all of those things in place and we're ready. We're going to continue to monitor the weather over these next few days and we'll make any decisions we have to make about school uh, based on the information we're given. And you may be thinking, wow, 
it's a good thing we're in remote learning and it is a good thing that we're in remote learning for everybody because it does give us an added level of flexibility that we would not typically have. However, our kindergarten through first graders or pre-K through first graders are scheduled to return to school this Wednesday. So two days from now, uh, they are scheduled to return to school and we want to make sure that that return is as safe as possible. So we will watch these storms. If we have to delay that restart, we will. Uh, if we have to push it back a day or two, we will, but we're not going to force our youngest children out into a bad weather situation. So we work hand in hand with the um, county's Office of Emergency Management. They will help give us guidance and we will continue those conversations. You know, at 10 p.m. every night, there's a big update. And so we'll be definitely tuned into that update if we have to make a decision about Wednesday. So for you, you youngest learners or some of you uh, that have students that have been in school already because your student has some needs that we needed to meet in the school building, uh, we will try to make that decision for, for Wednesday um, tomorrow afternoon by four o'clock, say at the latest. Okay, so we won't, we won't run it into nine or 10 o'clock tomorrow night. We'll make the decision earlier so you will know. What I, my advice to you right now uh, is have an alternate plan ready. Okay, so uh, if you were planning to have your kid at school, please have an alternate plan ready just in case we have to make that decision so that uh, you're not caught off guard and, and you're not ready. So uh, already go ahead and start having those conversations and then we'll monitor it. Now, will we close school? Maybe, all right? It depends on the situation. Uh, there are different degrees and different things that we can do in this situation. So the first might be to say, we're not gonna have any students in the building. We're gonna have everybody at home, okay? And we're just gonna do remote learning for that day. It's gonna count as a school day, but we're gonna do remote learning. Um, another step that we could take would be to also say that we are not gonna bring any of our employees in. They are going to all work remotely and they will still do remote learning uh, remotely. Now, if we get into a situation where that storm doesn't turn and it comes a little more directly at us and we are further impacted, then, and we have, let's say, large scale power outages or internet interruptions, then we may have to make the decision to actually close school. Now, the challenge there is when we close school, we, we are potentially going to have makeup time that we have to do to make up for those closed days. So that'll be the last step that we'll do, but if we're forced to do it, we will. One of the things that we all have to remember is, uh, Entergy is the power supplier for a lot of our school district and not only our buildings, but also um, you and your neighborhoods and your homes. And a lot of their power plants and a lot of their infrastructure is actually located in East Texas. So uh, even if it doesn't hit us directly here, if it hits East Texas and into Louisiana, our power supply could be affected. And so uh, we'll take all that into account if we do have school. So we, we don't cancel school, but we say everybody's gonna be remote or for our older students you are already remote but your power is out or your internet's down, how will you handle that? How will you do attendance? Will you be counted absent? And, and we'll work with you on that. Um, perhaps you can email into your teacher and just let them know, hey, I, I worked on my assignments today and we'll be able to count you present um, for doing that. And you could do that via your phone if you needed to. We're gonna find ways to work that out. But I would encourage, uh, just as much as I would encourage parents of younger kids that plan to send their kids to school on Wednesday to have an alternate plan, I would encourage our students, also our teachers, to have plans in place. So if you're going, you know, there's that potential teachers that Wednesday or Thursday, you may need to teach remotely from your home. Do you have what you need? Are you set up? Do you need to preload assignments over the next two days into your Canvas or Seesaw so that if we do have power outages or, or if your own um, power or internet is interrupted, you'll be ready to handle that. But um, hey, it's 2020, okay? What greater year to have two hurricanes at once? Um, the best news about that is we are now prepared to handle anything and we'll handle this just as we always do and we handle everything. So we'll work through it. It's all gonna work out. Sun's gonna come up the next day and we will be ready um, to make any adjustments that we need to make. So uh, that's our weather uh, update. Didn't really think we'd have to start with that, but, but there we are. But we're excited because school is underway, okay? We started now on August 12th, and here we are. We now have multiple school days um, starting into our third week of school, and it's not perfect, and we know that. 
for 40,000 of you, you want to be in person. You didn't necessarily want online learning, uh, and yet here you are, and it's a challenge. And we are working to find that balance each and every day. Um, I'll get one email from a parent that says, this is, um, you know, you're not challenging us. You promised me you were going to challenge us. And then the next email I get is from another parent that says, this is overwhelming. It's too much. We can't handle this. And everyone's house is different and that's okay. All right? We understand and respect that. And that's why we have this ramp up online plan, just as we have our, our big ramp up plan for going into school. And so online school right now looks different than it will on September 8th. We've talked about that many times. Once we get back to September 8th and we can bring back the 40,000 students or so that want to be in person, uh, the, uh, the 26,000 that are staying at home are making that family commitment to be online learners. And that's what it will take. It will take a family commitment um, to make that work and make it successful. Because at that point, those students at home will be doing the same curriculum the same grades, the same assignments, the same GPA, everything the same as our students that are in person. Now, that will also come with the same level of commitment, right? If you think about a high school student who is going to be at school for seven hours and then come home and might have two or three hours of homework, that's a 10 hour day. It's not reasonable to think that when we get past September 8th, if you're an online learner, that you can spend three hours and achieve the same amount of work. That's, that's just not feasible. You're going to have to put in the same level of effort as your peers that are in school. And we are on an asynchronous plan. And so it may not be that you're logged in the entire school day. Um, your campus will give you the details of that, but, um, but it is going to require commitment. And then certainly for younger learners, we know that we're still trying to support them in how to work through Canvas and how do I work through Seesaw and they're learning the platforms. And so that comes with challenges for mom and dad as well. And, but, uh, we're trying to ease into that, and I know at times it feels like we're not easing as much as we as we should, and, and we might be overburdening you, and for that I apologize to you. We, we're trying our best to find the balance, but it's, it's just not perfect at this point, and we know that, but we want it to be, and we're going to keep working at it. You know, we saw a great example today where uh, our, a few of our learning platforms actually crashed. Zoom and Canvas, they were not our issues. It was not internal to us. They were nationwide issues. And you say, well, well what happened? Well, my guess is probably hundreds or if not thousands of school districts across the nation started school today, virtually. So we had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of more children now accessing Canvas and accessing Zoom. And those platforms probably just weren't ready. So we can for that's foreshadowing to me is guess what's going to happen next Monday? Probably the same thing because a lot of school districts are going to start school next Monday as well. And so um, don't let that shock you. Once again, we're just we're all going to be flexible. We're all just going to deal with it. I hope it doesn't happen, but I won't be shocked if it does. So we'll make the adjustments just as we did today. Thank you all for uh, making the necessary adjustments and we'll work out the attendance to make sure that you get your credit for um, making your attempts today. But um, those type of hiccups and challenges are gonna happen and sometimes they are internal to us and we can fix them and we can learn. And then sometimes they are external to us and all we can do is you know, make phone calls and, and try to communicate to you what we've learned through our phone calls. Now, uh, for our virtual learners, uh, we're gonna have a special video message that's going to be coming to you to talk more about those expectations and what you can expect your school to look like after September 8th, uh, and it will be featuring uh, some of our assistant superintendents. So Dr. Upshaw, who's our assistant superintendent for teaching and learning, and then our three assistant superintendents that are over each level. So Dr. Debbie Phillips is over our elementary schools. Dr. Shelley Winkler is over our middle school. So that's intermediate and junior high. And then Mr. Greg Colshan, who you've all met a few times um, through these conversations is over our high school. So the four of them, we're gonna put together a video. We will email it directly to you virtual learners to make sure that we are communicating properly with you and that you feel comfortable about the road that is ahead for you. Uh, also want to really emphasize that it doesn't matter if you're in person or if you are at home doing work remotely, we care about you and your whole health. And so you're going to see investment in our curriculum in our social and emotional learning. 
um, both online and in person. We understand there's a, been a mental health strain that's been associated with everything that's been going on uh, over these last few months. So we're gonna work to make that happen. Also, our counselors are gonna be available, not just the students in person, but they will be able to work with students remotely as well. So I don't want you to feel like you're disconnected from resources. Additionally, we have two great resources, anonymous alerts and kid chat. And you can see the information there on the screen. Um, once again, this could be in-person learners or remote learners. If you have something going on in your world, um, perhaps it's with you and it's something you need help with. Perhaps it's with a friend of yours or something that someone has told you and you're worried and you're concerned about the well-being of someone else, then you can use these two methods. The Kid Chats, the phone, anonymous alert allows you to text and you can get the help that you need or, or get the help to someone else. So those are very important. And once again, they're open to all of our students, regardless if you're a virtual learner um, or an in-person learner. Now, we, we go all the way back to the end of June or, or, or middle of June, and we came out and sent you all a letter that said we were going to delay the start of face-to-face -face instruction until September 8th at the earliest but we would reevaluate during the week of August 24th to determine if September 8th could really happen. And during that time, I told you that I felt confident that we could get to September 8th. Many of you contacted me and you said, are you really confident or are you just saying that to try to appease everyone and you know, kick this can down the road? And I, and I tried to make it clear to you that I felt good about it. I felt good about our plan uh, and, I, and I really felt like we could make it happen. Well, today I'm happy to tell you that I had conversations uh, a few last week and a great um, in-depth conversation this morning with the Montgomery County Public Health District and they have given us the green light to go to school on September 8th just as we have planned. So that is great news for those of you that want face-to-face -face learning. Our ramp up plan is on time and it is going to happen. So we'll talk a little bit more about our ramp up plan uh, as we move forward. But that's the, the, the biggest breaking news of the night right there uh, is we are on track, we are on pace, and it is going to happen exactly as we laid out for you weeks ago on our ramp up plan. We are on schedule to make it happen. Now we've had other great news that's happened over these last few weeks, One, and, and they really all center around the county. We, we're very blessed and fortunate to live in Montgomery County and have uh, great people working with us. So speaking of the public health district and the hospital district, uh, they reached out about two weeks ago and said, we would like to make rapid testing available to any staff members you have that are showing symptoms of COVID-19. Now that was very significant because while we had a contract with another local clinic, we weren't getting results back for 10 days, 14 days, which meant that employee had to miss all the days in between until we got their confirmed negative test back. And also, we, we couldn't tell other people that they were potentially uh, at risk if they had been exposed until we got the positive test back. So uh, we were in a bit of a tough situation as we continued to look for um, rapid testing solutions, and it was a struggle. Well, the hospital district reached out and made these rapid tests available to us, uh, and we started using those last Monday. And we now have the ability to send any employee that is symptomatic over to the hospital district. They have to go through our channels here. You can't just show up over there. You have to go through our channels. Uh, and we are able to get tested and we get results back in two hours. So in just one week, we have saved over 250 staff days that we would have had someone at home uh, in quarantine waiting for results that we were able because of a negative test to bring them back to work and allow them to do what they love to do all because of the Montgomery County Hospital District's uh, generosity and investment in teachers. And so we thank them so much for that and helping us. Uh, our local county government is also making a great investment uh, in our school district and in our students. Uh, we have a $1.33 million purchase that we're doing with the state of Texas for technology. It's called the Operation Connectivity um, Program. And we're buying additional laptops and additional hotspots. And the state is helping to kick in some money um, to pay half of that. So that still left us with uh, over a $680 bill to us. Well, about a week and a half ago, TEA told us, look, if you can get your local municipality or county government to 
chip in a portion of this money, then we as the state will add more money in as well. And so we made a few phone calls to our county government, and I will tell you that from Judge Keogh through every commissioner, they could not have been more supportive and more wonderful in wanting to help our students with connectivity. And so our board approved um, a member, uh, an MOU uh, from last week at our board meeting to work with the county, and the county is going to finalize that. And at this point, we believe that they will be committing to us $341,500 to help with this grant. And with the amount of money that the state is going to put in as well, it is going to save us over $680,000, which means we can take that $680,000 and reinvest it back into either more technology or reinvest it back into more things that will help keep our buildings and our students and our staff safe through this COVID situation. So um, what, a, what a wonderful partnership, and it's, this is how it's supposed to work, right? When you see all these entities coming together to support our community. So we say big thank you to our Montgomery County government um, the commissioners, the judge, the hospital district, the public health district, everybody that is helping to support us here in Conroe ISD, we are very thankful for that. Now, we have talked over and over again during these conversations that our two main objectives are to protect our community and to protect the school year, right? We wanna keep everyone safe, and then we wanna open schools, keep schools, and then keep schools open, all right? That's been our focus. and. Uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about a dashboard so that you could see the exact same data that we see internally. And I'm happy to tell you that our dashboard is now up. Now it is not perfect, um, but we're still working to, to, to make it maybe more perfect and, and more pretty, but all the data is there and we want you to see it. So I'm gonna switch over now to our my screen view here and try to walk you through it. So this is the Conroe ISD homepage. This is our, our main page. So if you just go to ConroeISD.net, you will see this page. And right here, this is a new yellow button. So you can't miss it. It's, it's very easy to see right here in the middle, COVID-19 dashboard. So if you click the dashboard and here it is, there's a lot of information here. I'm, I'm not gonna just read it all to you, but I want you to see the highlights of what's going on on this page. You can see the total number of cases in Conroe ISD since May. You can see the number of students absent currently and the number of employees absent currently. Now you can also go down and pick um, the date, just a date range that you wanna see, but let's start with just what we see here in this first graph. So what are the positive reports by day? How many students or, and employees have reported positive by day? So you can just hover over and you can see you're in green, so that's students, and now you can, it'll just show you the students, so it makes it a little easier to see, or you can move over and you can see blue, which is just employees. Now the other option you can have, if you're looking at this and you think, man, it's just, there's a lot going on here, and in the next graph, there's a whole lot, you could just go down here and click students off if you want. Now you're only seeing employees. It makes it a little easier to see, but we wanna include all the information for you that we can. So you can see here, now this, data updates twice daily. It'll update in mid-morning and it'll update in the afternoon as well. So when you log in like today, for example, you're seeing the, the mid-afternoon update that shows that we had three students test positive today. Well, after the update, we actually had two more students test positive today. So if you log back in tomorrow morning, you're gonna see this bar is going to change and it's going to say five. And then over here in employees, you can see where it says we had one. Well, in the, the after the afternoon update, we actually had three more employees test positive. So if you log back in tomorrow, you're gonna see that's gonna be at four. So actually we had nine total positive cases today, but you can see how this information and this data could lag a little bit, um, you know, depending upon when you log in. Now, another very important thing is to think about isolation and quarantine. And you think, well, what do you mean and what's the difference? So we put the definition here. Isolation is employees or students who have tested positive or are showing symptoms of COVID-19. So you think about those check-ins that we ask you to do where you check for symptoms and, and you know, as an employee, the same thing will happen for, for students. But as an employee, if I wake up in the morning 
and I go through my checklist and it says, you know, do you have a cough? And I have a cough, I have to say yes. And do you have a fever? If I say yes, well, now I am symptomatic of COVID-19 symptoms and I will be sent into isolation until I can go have a, a test that comes back negative or, or positive and then, I, and then I would shift. Now, quarantine means, um, uh, actually, I just said it. Uh, and then quarantine means that you have been exposed to someone that has a lab confirmed positive test. So I may not necessarily be sick, but I might have been with someone and not wearing and not not wearing proper PPE and um, not properly socially distancing from that person. And now I've been exposed. I'm considered a close contact. And that means I go into quarantine. Now, the challenge with quarantine is you cannot test out of quarantine. So if you are placed in quarantine, it is a 14 day quarantine, two full weeks of quarantine, and you can't test out. So we wanna do all that we can to avoid quarantine. You wanna avoid quarantine for your student because you don't want them to have to shift to remote learning for two weeks. But we also want to avoid quarantine of our staff because not having enough staff in the building would be one of the things that would force us to have to close a school or force us to close as a school district if we don't have staff available. So um, this is that second chart and you can see where we are. And once again, you can hover and just see um, employees isolated, total number of employees that were out today is 104. And, and you do need a little context here, right? We have 8,500 employees. And so we'll, we'll probably add that somewhere just so that you can put that into context when you see a number. You know, 100 out is a lot. 100 out of 8,500 is, is a little different. You know, it's a little over 1%. Uh, so when you think about um, students, we have 65 or 66,000 students, but only uh, about 40,000 will be in person. So, um, you know, we won't necessarily be tracking the remote learners on this. So you'll, you'll really be seeing this out of 40,000 students daily. So um, once again, you can click and you can see different things. Now, employee attendance is gonna be real important because uh, what's added on this graph, and it looks a little jumpy at this point, and, and uh, it will for a few days, but until we get um, into the regular learning, but uh, this is important because we wanna see what our attendance is uh, for our employees. So are we hitting a point where as many employees are absent every day? And how does that compare to last year? So we've shown that just so that you can get that comparison. You can know like, yeah, it looks like it's a lot of teachers, but really it's the same number that were out last year. So I think we're okay. We're looking, we're looking good. Um, the green line is really important as well because the green line is the subfill rate. So if we have a hundred teachers that are out across the district on any given day, we have a hundred substitutes that fill in for them. We are in good shape. If we have 100 teachers out across the district and only 40 of them get subs, that means we have 60 classrooms that did not get a teacher for that day. We are in bad shape. So this chart is going to allow you to see that. And then the next graph will be student attendance data. And it will not begin to populate until September 8th when we have students in person. So then that graph will become active. And then the final graph at the bottom is our Montgomery County active cases. So you can see, you know, last time we visited, we talked about that trend was, was going so well, it was, it was really dropping. Um, here over the last four or five days, it's actually um, began to increase a little bit, but some of that is, is to do with a reporting error from the state. I um, did talk that over with the hospital district today. Um, the state had delayed some reporting, and so they're trying to catch up and get those included in our numbers. So some of that could be a little skewed um, right now on the uh, on the state's data. So, well, what can close us? And, and so when you look at this dashboard, how's this dashboard gonna help you know if we're in any danger of being forced to close? Well, uh, district-wide, you know, you're, we're gonna be looking at substitute and fill rate and how many teachers are out and you know, are we having problems? And we might think, well, okay, district is, is good, but I wanna know just about my child's campus. Well, you can see that here. So you could go down here and, and I'm just gonna pick on Conroe High School because they're the closest school to us, uh, right across the street from us here tonight. So uh, I'm gonna pick on them this evening. So you pick Conroe High and you hit view. And you can see here, and let's go down because these are the numbers that are important, right? 
here we go. So today at Conroe High, they had three students that were total that were out. Two of them were quarantined, which means they were in close contact with somebody that had a positive test. One was isolated, which means they either tested positive or they were showing symptoms. Now on the faculty side, you can see that there were a total of four out, three were quarantined, and one was isolated, once again. So you can watch these numbers uh, specifically for your children's campus. You'll be able to keep that updated. And the same thing with the fill rate and the, the teacher attendance down below and the positive test. So uh, you, you're gonna be able to see exactly what we see. We promised you transparency in the process and that's what you're gonna get here. So you can see exactly what we can see. So what can close us is a lack of staff or if we see hot spots begin to occur. So if you see certain schools that they really begin to spike, then the public health department could then make the choice to say, you need to close that school for a week or two weeks or whatever it may be to try to stem that um, outbreak in that school. So you can watch that from this dashboard as well. Now, what can you do to help? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, one of the things that you can do to help is you can apply to be a substitute teacher. Um, we're going to have an opportunity for you to be a substitute teacher if that's what you want to be. We are hiring subs right now and we are worried about our sub um, group because it's possible that you know, many of our subs are retired teachers and they may, um, you know, due to their age or, or their health, they may not want to come and sub. So we're going to need substitute teachers. We're also going to need bus drivers. We always need bus drivers, but now more than ever, we need bus drivers. We have seen a lot of bus drivers, once again, because of their health or their own family considerations, they've had to make choices to um, step away from their positions as bus drivers, and that could cause us to have service delays. So if you would like to be a bus driver, you saw there we have our auxiliary job fair. If you just go to our human resources website, maybe Andrew, can I go back to the computer here and we can show that. So once again, we're back now on the home page. If you just go to careers at the very top of the home page and select careers, you go to our um, directly to our human resources website. So you can see there the, about the virtual job fair. If you'd like to be a bus driver, that gives you that opportunity. And then over on the right hand side here, you can see a link to substitutes. You can click directly on that. That will give you more information about being a substitute teacher. So, you know, if you're really invested in this and you want to figure out how you can make a difference, and you can get involved to make sure that we can stay open, You're, you want to do all you can, those are two wonderful ways that you can do it and make a few extra dollars along the way, but that is a way to reinvest in your school. So we would love to have you uh, in either of those positions. All right, well, let's transition now and talk a little bit more about our ramp up plan. Uh, we shared that with you weeks ago where we are now directly uh, in the ramp up plan and it's going very well and we're on schedule, as we talked about. Um, the hospital district has told us that it's good to go, so this schedule is now confirmed all the way through and will get us to September 8th. So we did start with uh, some of our learners that had specific needs uh, during last week, and we are planning right now to have our kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, and first graders in school on Wednesday, hurricanes willing, Okay, we will start with them and we're ready to support them and let them have a wonderful first few days with extra hands on deck to really take care of them and have them prepared um, for their school year. So we're really excited about that. Now, if you happen to have a pre-K student or a kinder student and you've not yet registered uh, them for school, you need to get on that right away. If you haven't done it, you need to make contact with the school tomorrow. You might have been thinking, oh, well, I was gonna wait till September 8th. I didn't know they were starting early. Well, now, we, we want you to know we are actually starting on Wednesday. So please get enrolled so that we can have them there. Now, we, when you look at the ramp up plan, you can see that we will have transportation provided, we will have proper PPE, and we also will be serving lunches on those days. So um, you can see that, and we are so excited to have those kids on campus. Now, the following week, uh, we will have an opportunity for every student in Conroe ISD to attend their campus um, for one day. And that's going to be a great orientation opportunity well the building is not at full capacity so it's going to allow our teachers to get comfortable with having students in the classroom it's also going to allow the students to be comfortable because remember we do a lot of talking as adults the kids may not talk about it but they're feeling that same anxiety right 
they don't know what school is going to be like and they're worried about that and and oftentimes as adults we project our worries on them and they carry those as well as their own worries and so um, this is going to allow them to see what school is going to look like and how will lunch work and how will we get from class to class and they'll, they'll get a chance to see it so uh, next Monday you can see uh, students with the last name A through C, Tuesday D through J, Wednesday K through Q, and the on um, Thursday R through Z. And they are only to attend one day, so it's not a cumulative thing where you we're adding more students each day. You only attend the day um, for your last name. If you have you know blended families and, and you need to work out maybe with different last names, your campus will work with you. Okay, there'll be no problem. We will be running our full bus fleet on those days, so we should have normal routes. Um, ready to go on those days. If you have not yet registered for transportation, you need to do that, please. Um, go to our transportation website and make sure you've registered for transportation because right now we're trying to route those buses and if we don't know that you need a bus, we won't have that bus routed for you and we'll miss you. Um, not only on that day, but on the first day of school. At the same time, if your student is registered for transportation, but you know you're not going to utilize that, you, you're gonna be a car rider all year because that's what you feel like is best, you can go in and unregister for transportation. I had to do that as a parent myself. Um, my daughter was still registered and she'll be in a car every day. And so I, I went in and unregistered so that we could take her stop off the route and, and you know, hopefully we can know that the bus will be less crowded. Would encourage you, if you can, to drive your, to drive your children to school. Uh, we're gonna do our best to social distance on a bus, but it's going to be difficult. So um, the fewer students on the bus, the safer it makes for everybody on the bus. So if you are able to drive them, we would definitely encourage you to do that. If you need us and you need the transportation, we're gonna be there for you. Just make sure that you've registered and we have that in place. And then on um, September 8th will be our first day back after the holiday. And we will have all of those students that want to be in person back in the building on September 8th. And so the, the plan has worked just as we drew it up. We're really proud of it, and, and we're excited to welcome, uh, like I said, almost 40,000 or a little over 40,000 students onto campus on September 8th. Now, what we are entering into on September 8th really is a social contract with each other, okay? Um, when we bring this many people together and into a building together, it's going to require all of us being willing to do exactly what is needed to keep the schools open. There are many of you out there that really want schools opened, okay? There are a lot of you out there that need schools to be open and stay open, and we recognize that fact. Um, there are those out there that don't feel comfortable sending their kids to school and they're choosing the remote option and that's very appropriate. There may also be some of you out there that don't want to follow all of the procedures that are required to keep our schools open. And it'd be very appropriate for you to choose the online option as well, because those that are going to come to school have to be all in on keeping the schools open. Like I said, this is a social contract that we're making with each other, that we're gonna do all the things necessary to keep our schools open throughout the school year. Now, so we have to work to keep each other safe and keep our schools open. I, I had a conversation last week, which really um, helped center my thought a little bit and made me feel a little better. On Thursday, uh, every Thursday, we have a superintendent's call with the commissioner of education. That's where all 1,100 superintendents in the state get on a Zoom call with the commissioner. He had a special guest this past week as a superintendent of Bernie ISD. Now, Bernie is a very small district compared to us, but they're a suburb out in uh, Central Texas, San Antonio area, and they've actually started face-to-face -face instruction. And so he got to talk about what they've learned so far through face-to-face -face instruction. And, and he said, really, it's going well. And all of the concerns they had about COVID, they, they, they put in all their time and effort and, and had all the conversations, the same conversations we're having. And he said, really, once school started, a lot of that stuff sort of faded away and just happened naturally. It was just like normal school stuff was the challenges that they've had to deal with. And um, you think about the first few weeks of school, normal school stuff is, you know, lunches and schedules being right and transportation challenges and, and uh, traffic jams and the car rider line. And so we know all those things are coming, but he said really the, 
the, the being safe and washing hands and wearing of masks for kids while we worried a lot about that, he said, it, it really wasn't a concern. Like uh, he said that he hadn't had a conversation about masks at all since school started. And he had a lot of conversations about masks before school started, but since school started, the teachers who are just wonderful have done a great job. They just manage it and it just works. And so um, actually when that call ended, I reached out to him directly because I wanted to hear a little more. And, and I said, you know, talk to me a little further, especially about the mask. I want to know how it's working really, um, you know, not with the audience of 1,100 people. It's this the one-on-one. And he said, no, really, it's been, it's been no issue. And I said, well, tell me about the, little, the littles, you know, your, your, your very youngest. And he said, it's not been a problem. They're, they're wearing them. They're doing great. We're, we're still teaching and we're helping them learn how to do it. Um, and they, they can't wear them all day. And they're, and they're trying to learn the right way. He said, but really, it's just not a problem. The teachers handle it beautifully and it works. And, and he said, I meant what I said. I, I haven't had a conversation about it since we started school. I said, wow, okay. That brought me a lot of ease to know that somebody is doing it and it's working and, and all the procedures and the plans, they work. And so um, that made me feel good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about masks. I know there's been a lot of confusion about masks and I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry that you, um, that there's been confusion, but things continue to change daily and we try to keep up and one principal will send out an email on Wednesday and then the rules change on Thursday and then the different principal sends out their rules on Thursday and then the rules change again on Friday. So now you might have kids in three campuses and you've got three sets of rules and you're going, I don't understand. Does this mean every school is going to have its own mask policy? And no, it, it's not. Um, schools will not have their own mask policy. The mask uh, policy is a district-wide policy. We'll all be on the same page. I'm going to try to talk us through it tonight so that we all understand it. If I make any mistakes, I'll, we'll, we'll correct it. But um, hopefully we've all got a handle on it. We'll talk to principals about it tomorrow and you'll hear direct information from your principals. But let's talk about that. Grades 3 through 12 uh, are expected to be in a mask uh, at all times. Okay, so th they're going to wear masks in the building. They're in class, they'll be wearing their mask. There may be opportunities while they're in class that if they are separated by 6 to 10 feet and they're working individually, there'll be opportunities for mask breaks. Okay, that's we all want that same thing as an adult. And where it's appropriate for children, we'll do that as well. But we don't want to put them at risk for getting sick or getting quarantined. So we'll have to be smart about that. Now, when they go to recess or PE, uh, if they're actively engaged in vigorous exercise, and then they can take the mask off. So what does that mean? All right, well, if you go to fifth grade PE, uh, you might see some kids out playing in a soccer game. They wouldn't need to wear a mask. They're out there outside engaged and playing. You might also see a group of five or six kids standing over in the shade and just visiting with each other during their recess time. Those students should wear a mask because they're, they're going to be in close contact with each other and, they're, in, and you know, they're just talking. They should wear their mask at that time. So for recess, that, that's the rule, right? If you're, vigor, if you're vigorously exercising, engaged in activity, you wouldn't have to wear a mask. You'll wear your mask on the way there, but you wouldn't have to wear it um, when you're actually playing. Now for our youngest students, kindergarten through two, they will, or pre-K through two, they will wear masks when they're in common areas, uh, that would mean bus, the bus, everyone on the bus will wear a mask. Um, when they're walking into the building during the, you know, at the beginning of the day, when any time they're walking down the hallways, they'll be in masks. Um, when they, as they head to the cafeteria or head to specials or any of those things, they'll be uh, in masks. And then we are asking at this point, parents, um, we are asking that those youngest students would wear masks in the classroom. And I, and I emphasize that term asking because we're going to try to help them learn and work through what needs to be done, but that is going to become an expectation. So today it is an ask. It is going to become a requirement. And the reason it's going to become a requirement is because the hospital district uh, and the public health d district has informed us that that is the only way we're going to keep our, our teachers safe, our kids safe, keep them out of quarantine and keep our schools open. And they actually sent a letter today and I, I have a copy of the letter. And we've actually <clears throat> uploaded it on our website where you can see the same letter that I see. Um, Andrew, I'll ask if you can go back to the computer and I'm going to show where that letter is in case you'd like to see it. Um, you can go right here to coronavirus um, website and let's see here. 
you can see here the Montgomery County Letter of Advisement, uh, 82420, and it is there for you to see. Um, but there are a couple of things that they talk about here, and one of those is that all students, regardless of age, uh, including under the age of eight, should be in a mask. And so we're going to take that guidance. That's what we've done the entire time through this process is we've listened to the health experts, we've listened to doctors. And so um, while we're going to transition into that, because our initial information that we put out said K to two, pre-K to two would not be required. So we're transitioning to that point. But if um, it is coming, so if that's going to be something that you don't want for your children, you have the opportunity now to choose remote learning. You can make that choice now. We can switch over at this point. That will be fine. Um, but I really do think that we can ease into this, help support your students, and it's not going to be an issue for them. Once again, for our youngest learners too, there'll be plenty of opportunities for them when they're socially distant, and they're separated and working individually to get those mask breaks. Our teachers have all the guidance needed as to how to properly care for the mask, make sure students are washing their hands before and after removal. Everything that needs to be done, they'll be ready to handle that. That's just what teachers do, okay? Um, when you think about a pre-kindergarten pre or a kindergarten teacher, they're teaching kids a variety of things from how to put their shoes on, how to button or snap their pants, or what, there's a variety of, of just life things that they have to teach. This is just one more of those things um, that they can teach it. I have full confidence that they can and they will work it out. What the mask is going to do is not only keep your child safe, not only keep the teacher safe, but it's also going to lower the risk of quarantine. So we go back and we talk about, well, what is quarantine? Well, quarantine means you get sent home for two weeks if you are in close contact with anybody that has a positive test. So if you're in a classroom with other students and, and you're not wearing a mask, they're not wearing masks, and anyone in that classroom tests positive for COVID-19, the whole classroom goes home, okay? Everyone not wearing a mask goes home for two weeks. We don't want to get in a situation where we're constantly sending your child home for two weeks. We want your child to be in school. And so by wearing a mask, you reduce that likelihood of being quarantined significantly. You reduce the likelihood of exposing your teacher to COVID-19 and forcing them to be out for two weeks and forcing everyone in the classroom to have to have a substitute teacher for two weeks. And you also lower the likelihood that a school becomes considered a hot spot and gets closed for the entire school or the entire district gets closed because we now have an increased number of positive tests and quarantines. So wearing a mask is really critical it's not just about you, it's about everyone else uh, in the situation as well. And like we've talked about, this is a social contract. So if we're gonna be in person, all of us have to be all in on in person and willing to do everything we can to keep everyone safe. Now, a lot of conversations about, well, well what is, like, give me the definition of a mask, what counts as a mask, what's okay, what works? Well. That your, your standard cloth mask, and it could be, you know, one of those little blue ones what, that, you, that you buy in a package, that's fine. You know, one that fits um, appropriately. This is your standard cloth mask, okay? This can be washed at home. Um, standard mask, okay? This is what you're going to see our staff wear. Staff is, is asked to wear mask at all times unless for some reason instructionally they can't. For instance, we have teachers that um, teach in our uh, deaf ed program and where students need to be able to see the teacher's mouth, so we'll make some adjustments for that. Um, but you're going to see our teachers in masks because our health experts say this is the best way to keep yourself safe and everyone around you safe. So this is the best option, okay? Wearing a mask is the best option. Now, the second best option is what's called a gaiter, right? So you may have seen these. Uh, a lot of times people wear them when they're fishing. If you've seen any pictures, uh, I've noticed some pictures uh, in the paper recently of our athletes. This is what you'll see people wearing uh, in athletics. Our coaches will wear this in athletics. Our kids wear these in athletics. You'll, you'll see um, kids participating, large varsity athletes participating in athletics wearing one of these. So these fit, uh, they go over your head, but they fit and you just wear them like this. Now, the problem with these, what makes them not as good as a mask is they're thin. They're just one layer of lycra thin material. 
Okay, they meet the definition of a face covering, of a cloth face covering, but they may not provide the same level of protection as say three layers in a mask. So uh, some people have talked about, well, you know, if I double it up when I put it on, does that give more protection? And I would think, yes, it's now twice as much, but there, there is no standard for what material these are made of or how thick they are. So, you know, you, you might buy some on Amazon versus, you know, going to Academy or Dix and buying one and, and it might come back and not be as thick and may not offer the same level of protection. So, but this, th these are okay. Um, for students. For our staff, we do not prefer these to be worn in the classroom. Uh, you'll see them worn in the athletic setting, um, but we don't really prefer these in the classroom because we don't believe they offer the same level of protection as a mask does. So, um, but, but these are okay. Now, our, the big concern with these is the fact that they do go around your neck and they're elastic and stretchy. So we have a strangulation concern, especially with the younger kids. You know, just they could be running and get, get that caught or, you know, if they wear it out on the playground and it gets caught, those are the things that would concern us um, with these. So that's a you know, decision you need to think about as a family and how strong is your child and, and how aware are they of their surroundings. But, that, uh, but these are okay. It's been a question. It's come up a lot. I know that we've been bounced around a little bit. Gators are okay. And the last thing uh, you hear talked about is a face shield. So this is a face shield. This is actually a really cool face shield uh, because this face shield was built by Texas Torque, which is one of our high school robotics team. Um, they actually built this using uh, Conroe ISD 3D printers. So they have built these face shields and TEA has stated that students can wear face shields uh, in lieu of cloth coverings. Now, um, my advice to you, or, or what I would share with you, and you can see it in the, the letter, if you go back and read Montgomery County Hospital District's letter, they're very clear, and all the doctors that we talked to are very clear about these, that they do not really provide any protection um, for you from uh, COVID-19. So because they're open and your air flows out and air can flow in, uh, they're not going to provide you protection. So you can choose this as a parent for your student. But what you must understand is when it comes time to quarantine, if the decision has to be made about quarantine, this will be treated just like you were wearing no protection at all. So this will not keep your child from being quarantined. Um, they'll still be quarantined if they are in any kind of close contact and they're wearing one of these face shields. Now, um, these are great if they're combined with a mask. So, you know, you may see a lot of our teachers that actually go mask and face shield and the benefit there is the face shield protects them the eyes as well so you'll see many teachers wearing face shields but you won't see Conroe ISD teachers wearing face shields and no mask because that's that's not okay students it is an option for students to go face shield no mask now the face shield guidance from TEA says it has to be a full face shield so I've seen some pictures where there's little plastic pieces that just cover from here to here um, that would not be okay as a face shield, you know, it's just a plastic piece that's protruding from the face. It has to be full face shield, covers the eyes all the way down to below the chin for it to meet uh, approval. So once again, approved for students, not approved for faculty unless they're also wearing a mask. Okay, so when we start the school year, just to kind of go back and want to wrap it up on the mask, so we're all on the same page. Pre-K to two will wear masks in all common areas and we will begin to work with them on being able to wear masks in the classroom because that requirement will be coming in the coming weeks based on the hospital district guidance. For third grade and up, we'll be in masks at all times. For all students, they go to recess. If they're actively playing, they can, we will have opportunity to take them off. For all students, we'll also be looking for opportunities to take breaks uh, from the mask in the classroom when it's appropriate but we don't ever want to do that in any time or in any way that will expose them to potentially get sick or to potentially get quarantined. So um, there will be guidance coming out. We'll have a conversation tomorrow morning with uh, all of our principals to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, and, and then you'll have more guidance coming from your campus, but that's the mass conversation. I hope that we have cleared up um, any of the confusion that we created. And once again, I'm sorry for, for any confusion that we have created, uh, but I do hope that we have made that work. And one note I'll give you about masks. I told you the Bernie 
superintendent um, you know, gave me great confidence. I had a conversation today through all of our conversations with the hospital district with Chief James Campbell. He is the EMS chief, highly regarded as one of the, the, the best EMS chiefs in the nation. And he actually is also a parent in Conroe ISD. You may remember Chief um, Campbell. He came when we had the hospital district folks, he and Dr. Dixon uh, came in and they talked about the importance of masks. And, um, but Chief is a Conroe ISD parent as well as being a great EMS chief. And he's a parent of a first grader. And so while I was on the phone today with Chief and we were talking about we are going to reopen and we feel good about our plan and, and that we're going to be moving to, to mass for all students. And, and um, I said, well, Chief, I'm, I'm curious. And I, and I got his permission to share this. But I said, what are you going to do with your first grader, Chief? And he said, well, we're going to send her to school. I said, OK. I said, well, how do you feel about her wearing masks? He said, I feel fine. She's going she's gonna to do great. We're already practicing at home. And um, you know we're we're being very positive with her because that's the energy we need her to get. And I said, well, are you are you worried at all? And he said, well, yeah, I'm worried like every parent, but I worry every year. Like every parent sending kids back to school every year, we all worry. So he said, I have all those worries, um, but I'm I've seen your plan. I've seen how you all are handling business. I see the procedures you have in place, and and we're going to do our part to to keep everyone safe. So we feel good about it. And so. That was another thing that made me feel good is, you know, that's a man that does what he does for a living and, and um, his first grade daughter, you know, after seeing everything that we're doing, that's the choice he's making. So I hope that that would give you all confidence, especially those of you with younger kids. I hope that that gives you confidence as well. So let's talk about quarantine a little further. OK, uh, and that question's come up a lot like, man, so if my kid's just sitting in a class and some kid tests positive, are they going to get sent home for two weeks? And the answer to that is not necessarily. Now, if people weren't wearing masks, then the answer would be yes. Uh, but we're going to be wearing masks, and so we're not, that's not going to be the problem. The only way that you'd get sent home is if you were found to be in close contact for too long. Well, it's our job um, through our procedures to not allow that to happen. So we're going to keep people away from each other so that they don't get um, much close exposure. So that's part of our procedures. Um, so in that case, let's say uh, you're in high school and one kid tests positive, what's going to happen? Well, the kid that tests positive is going to go home. We're going to have a conversation with that child to say, hey, you know, in the family, to say, Were there, is there anybody that you've been in close contact with? Like, is there, you know, do you ride to school with somebody in the car and y'all weren't wearing masks or all those? And, or is there anybody in, in your classes that you've been working directly with close by and y'all have not really been wearing your mask like you should? Um, talk, to, you know, talk to us about that. If your child is identified as somebody that's had close contact, then we will reach out to you directly and we will tell you and your child goes on quarantine. But for everybody else, you're going to get the standard letter that just says somebody tested positive in your, in your school and you're going to go on about your day. We are not going to close school because there was a positive test. Um, we're not going to tell you who the positive test was and you can go to our dashboard and you can see the numbers and, and you'll so you'll know the numbers or how many may have tested positive in a given day but we won't be sending your child home unless there's some type of extenuating circumstance like they weren't wearing the proper ppe or they didn't follow social distancing guidelines and they've you know created themselves in a close contact situation so um, that's the way quarantine will work and, and that's important. The other really big deal, the social contract of all of us working together is we have to make agreements here that we're not going to bring or send sick people to school. And you know, we're gonna ask you to do your, your screening weekly and, and daily really as a family, but you can't send sick children to school and in, infect a class and create this hotspot that could potentially close the school down. And, we all know that that's happened upon occasion where, you know, maybe we don't have a babysitter and so we give our kid Tylenol in the morning and then we send them to school and we hope everything's gonna be okay. And then three hours later, you get the call from the nurse that the fever spiked. Well, in today's world, that, that can create a huge problem um, for not only your child, but for everyone else in the school, um, from the students to the staff. And so that can't happen. Like this part of this social contract is we can't send sick people to school and um, it's the same conversation really for our employees that are watching. You can't come to school sick. And I know that um, the student side and the employee side, we sort of programmed everybody over all these years, like tough it out, show up, 
you know, you can grind through it and that's wonderful. And, and as an employee, it makes us a hard worker. Like, no, okay, it's, it's that it's not worth it in this situation. All of the incentives that, uh, that are out there for perfect attendance for students are gone. So there will not be attendance tied to tryouts or to, for awards or for um, parking spots or exam exemptions. It, those are all gone. We want you to stay home when you need to stay home. Now for kids, the great news is even if you end up just having strep throat, which would be awful, you feel terrible, but once you start to feel a little better, you can actually just do your work online right away and you wouldn't even be counted absent. So you could be an in, a face-to-face -face learner, but you shift immediately to online for that day or two days that you're out. You don't even get an absence, which is really cool. Um, for our employees, once again, we're gonna have that ability to test you quickly and we can get you back quickly if, if you're just having, you know, like I said, strep throat or some other illness, allergies, whatever it may be, but we'll be able to know that it wasn't COVID-19 before we uh, send you back to the school. So um, that's part of this social contract. It's part of what's really important to us that we, um, that we do. Water bottles, okay? One of the things that the hospital district talked to us about is water fountains can become a little bit of a breeding ground if we're not careful with water fountains. So we would encourage everyone to send their child to school with a full water bottle, put their name on it. Okay, it's really important. We don't want, we're not gonna be sharing masks and we're not gonna be sharing water bottles. So put their names on their masks, put their names on their water bottles, send them with it full. We are actually buying touchless bottle fillers for every campus. They are in the process of being installed right now. Um, so there will be a touchless bottle filler fountain on every campus and we will also have a few water fountains in the building that will be set up just to fill water bottles not for drinking out of but if you if you happen to walk in the building or you can prepare your kids for this that they will walk in to the building and they're going to see most of the water fountains covered up okay and that's just we don't want those to become a breeding ground so send them with water bottles also, just an update on um, our PPE. We talked about that was one of the reasons why we waited. We have now received all of our PPE, and so it has been delivered to campuses. They have the supplies that they need. We are still in the process of buying more and more supplies. So um, just actually last week, we opened a bid. We had numerous vendors that wanted to be a part of that bid, but now we're gonna have many vendors that we can purchase um, PPE or thermometers or, um, gloves, you name it, all, everything, hand sanitizer, all the things that we need to be safe. We're gonna have a variety of vendors that we can choose from and we can legally buy from now, which will make sure that we don't run out of stock. So uh, that's a wonderful thing. And I know that's an update that many of you wanted to hear as well. All of our cleaning protocols are in place. We've been doing those uh, in our buildings for the last few weeks. We know that they work. Um, we, we know that we're capable of making it happen. We know that we're gonna be ready for kids on Wednesday as long as the weather allows it to happen. We know that we're gonna be ready for kids on Monday, a quarter of our students returning on Monday, um, which when you think about that, now just, just you know, perspective is powerful. Um, on Monday, when we have a quarter of our, of our students that have just chosen face-to-face, -face, so you, know, you take out all those that, that didn't choose face-to-face, -face, so just a quarter of those that chose face-to-face -face is 10,000 students. 10,000 students is bigger than Willis ISD or, or Montgomery ISD or, you know, so it's a lot of kids still uh, on day one um, on August 31st. So that's really neat. And, and I can tell you that our, our campuses are so excited about that. They're ready to see kids uh, be in the buildings and be in place. And then September 8th, we'll start full speed face to face. And that ramp up will really uh, begin for our online learners. We'll be ready to, um, to really support um, those online learners, and there'll be a little bit of transition. I, I just wanted to prepare our, our virtual learners, if you're still with us, um, there will be a little bit of transition time as teachers, um, they're carrying uh, just a giant load, and it's a Herculean effort for many of them to both teach in person and online. And so, you know, there may be a little bit of time there as they're trying to get their bearings and, and figure out the systems that are gonna work for them. So be patient with them. Uh, as that happens, they're, they're doing all they can. I can assure you of that. They're working really hard. So um, all is well in Conroe ISD. Uh, it's nice when you make a plan and it actually works. Now, little things have changed and they're gonna continue to change. That's going to happen. But the ramp up plan is on schedule. We're going to be back in class. Uh, it's gonna work out. 
and, and we're going to keep everybody safe and we're going to keep our schools open. That's, I think if we all agree to this social contract that we're doing together, we are going to keep our schools open throughout this year, which I know that is what many of you want and many of you need, and we're going to make that happen. So um, I hope that these next few days you're able to stay well and stay safe with uh, the, the uh, impending weather that we have headed our way. I hope that we get a, a near miss, but uh, we will be back in contact tomorrow afternoon to talk about Wednesday's um, early childhood day and if that's going to happen or not. Um, and if it needs to delay a day or two, then so be it. We'll, we'll keep everybody safe and we'll make it happen. But um, it's exciting time. And you know, for this to be the 12th time that we've come together, uh, there's been a lot of times that I've wondered, when will it be that I can finally stand here and tell you schools are opening for sure and we're ready to have kids in the building and that day is today. And we're really excited for that. So thank you all for joining us. Appreciate you. Be safe. We look forward to seeing your kids very soon. Thank you.